Thank you, Brother Strickland. Thank you for the work you do every day. And I know it's not easy, but you can call him on a Saturday, Sunday, and he's somewhere answering the phone and somewhere solving a problem. Thank you for what you do. Our next speaker is Bert Royer. We will introduce uh, Joss Bizak, Executive Director of the Douglas Coldwell Layton Foundation. Bert started his apprenticeship in 1974 with the Iron Workers, Local 711, and he has worked as a connector, foreman, general foreman, and on numerous industrial projects around Canada. Uh, with Local 7, 771, Bert Roy was elected as a trustee, exec executive committee member, vice president, and president. In 1995, he was elected to, to the position of financial secretary, treasurer, and business manager. In 2012, he made a career change and started his new position as Canadian Regional Director for IMPACT, Iron Worker Management Progressive Action Cooperation Fund. Recently, Bert has worked with the Construction Industry Institute on mental health and a guide for the construction industry. I can think of no better person to introduce the Douglas Coldwell Layton Foundation on the, important they, on the important work they do with the CBTU. Please join me in welcoming Bert Royer. Good afternoon, brothers, sisters, guests. Let's talk about mental health. They've given me a few minutes, so I will, uh, for the past two years, I've been working on a mental health research project in the U.S. and uh, actually ended up as co-chair of the committee. The CII, Construction Industry Institute at the University of Texas, and the CSRA, Construction Safety Research Alliance, University of Colorado Boulder joined forces and they uh, got to work on a mental health in the construction industry research project. So Research Project 401 was born. The committee was made up of US and Canadian contractors, some big, some small. The goal of the committee was to identify stressors contributing to mental health in the construction industry. The research team, under the guidance of two PhDs and one PhD student, put together a fairly detailed survey that was distributed across North America. The survey included men, women, all ethnic groups, and we did one thing different. We included the office staff that work in construction companies because they are part of the industry too. They feel it. So in our survey, we received 1,197 responses, which is huge. I don't know if you've ever been involved in a survey, but if you get 500 responses, you've hit a home run. We had 1,197 proving that mental health is a big issue. The data was carefully analyzed, and we came up with a list of stressors affecting the people that work in our industry. Financial was number one. In all cases, the data was so close that they couldn't measure. It was just straight up financial was the number one answer. And financial was because of the irregular paychecks. It's feast or famine in construction. We know you work for six months, you're off for three months. So the financial was a, uh, was a problem for everybody. Job satisfaction was number two in our survey. And it's, uh, it includes bullying, harassment, the whole bit. But the main job satisfaction answers came from the older workers, people that are 50 and over, that have been in the industry for 30 years, they've paid off their house, some have a cottage, they all have kids, and now they have grandkids. They don't want to work weekends. They want the work-life balance to work. They, they're just, that was a big thing in our survey. Older workers were just not happy because of the amount of hours worked. And, uh, the last one is issues outside of the workplace, which were things like addictions and so on that they're not a part of the workplace, but they do affect the workplace. So now that we've identified the stressors, we're now in phase two of the project. I was there last week. The committee continues. We are going to work with each individual stressor and see what kind of solution we can come up with. 
My key takeaway from the two years on this committee is that we are not professionals when it comes to mental health. If somebody approaches you and they want to talk to you about their mental health, don't tell them about your issues. Listen to what they have to say. They trusted you enough to talk to you. Take the time and point them in the right direction because you can't say, I'll call you back. I'll talk to you tomorrow. If they're, if they're talking to you, take the time right then and there and take care of it. Confidentiality is a key to success when it comes to mental health because there's no magic wand to take care of a large group and take care of the mental health. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And we need to do a better job of slowing down, stopping, and listening to what people are saying. Because putting it off to tomorrow, sometimes it's too late. So take care of each other, and we're all in this together. I've been tasked to introduce Josh Bizak, is an NCO management professional and consultant in Ottawa. After many years of the, as the director of the stakeholder relations with the Ontario NDP Queen's Park, Josh was brought on as the founding director of development at the Broadbent Institute in 2011, where he was instrumental in growth and success. In 2018, Josh was named senior advisor of Canada's New Democratic Party under the leadership of Jagmeet Singh. In January 2021, Josh accepted the position of Executive Director of the Douglas Colwell Layton Foundation, bringing decades of experience in management and strategic campaign development to modernize the operations of the Tommy Douglas and Jack Layton charity. Josh and his wife, Lydia, enjoy the outdoors and share home with their dog, Rufus, near the Ottawa River. My friend, Josh. Good afternoon, friends. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, bring greetings from the Board of Directors and the staff of the Douglas Coldwell Layton Foundation. You know, I've been coming to this conference uh, for about 20 years. It's my first time to address all of you, and so I'm grateful for this opportunity. The foundation was established by Tommy Douglas over 50 years ago. We have a CRA mandate in our original letters of patent, essentially our Articles of Incorporation, that says we are to educate people about governance, political science, civic engagement, and we're supposed to do that through lectures and seminars, training, as well as our research and our reports and publications. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the, uh, the technician to uh, get our slide up. Last year, the foundation produced and published a report on the mental health and wellness of workers across the country. Coming out of the pandemic, we all knew that Canadian workers were suffering. And we also heard from a lot of big organizations, a lot of people talking about mental health. But rarely did we ever hear any empirical data supporting why people across this country were suffering with mental health distress. So we decided to look into it. And so last year we published our findings on the mental health and wellness of workers in the country. That helped us then to begin a conversation with the building trades. You just heard from Brother Royer, and thank you, Brother Royer, for that uh, lovely introduction. I'm, I'm grateful for that. You know, Bert was talking about the report that was published not too long ago there, looking at workers, building trades union members from across North America. We decided to take a look specifically at the construction trades union workers here in Canada. So I'm going to go through today some top line findings. We're going to review some of the data. This project that we have undertaken is a survey of your workers. 
In order to produce this work in collaboration with Canada's Building Trades Unions, and thank you, Sean, for being a, a fantastic partner to work with, we also brought on board Ernst Cliff Strategies. Ernst Cliff recently did similar work with the Armed Forces and National Defense, and we felt that they would be the perfect partner to be able to do this kind of important data research for us. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start talking about the, the, the more important, I guess, or the component to this research is that not only are we looking at the overall mental health, but we're also looking at substance use. It was brought up just a moment ago. We know that there is a, there's a problem across this country with substance use. Again, the question needs to be asked, why? How do these things happen? So we went to work. Um, we distributed a survey that is anonymous, completely confidential for your members to participate in. As Bert just mentioned, over 500 participants from the Canada's Building Trades Unions came out and provided us with insights. Now that, from our sample size, is a real good number. However, we want more data. And so at the end of this, I'm going to be talking to you about what we can do next. So these are the key findings that, uh, that we came across. And I think it's important for all of us to understand again that this is Canadian. 75% of our respondents had at least 10 years of experience in the trades. 97% believed that their work is important. However, almost half of the respondents say their mental health has been only fair or poor over the last 12 months. About 25% reported using substances regularly to cope with mental health. One third being reported being injured on the job that required some sort of drug or substance to uh, deal with pain. One third reported experiencing alcohol or substance addiction in their lives. The good news though is that about 90% of the workers who participated in this survey believe that their union provides services that are needed to support their overall health and 75% of respondents were aware of programs that are available to help them with their mental health. When asked what their priorities or the priorities of the unions or the contractors should be, overwhelmingly, the majority said that they wanted, to be re they wanted unions and employers to recognize that they have to deal with pain on the job. The second number one issue was to recognize that they have mental health concerns. The third most important to them 44% saying providing substance use support services to the members. So let's go ahead and take a deep look, but this is what I want to do here for this presentation. I, mental health is an issue for workers in every sector across the country. So we're going to compare some data between workers and building trades union members. So let's do that. Right off the bat, we can see that the building trades workers, by and large, are doing better. So the larger category is doing better, and there's some reasons for that we'll get into. However, when it comes to that final question of poor, we're seeing that there is a bump. There's an uptick there where your workers are doing less well than the Canadian average. But this is, this is why, there's some reasons here. In many ways, building trades members are not that much different from other workers. Now we know that that's not a full statement because obviously within the building trades there are very unique factors that we need to consider and we will. But right off the bat, we know your workers believe their work is important. They get meaning from their work. They learn 
on the job and they learn from their work and they get to use their skills and creativity. That means that they have a lot of fulfillment in the workplace and that's a, that's a good thing and I'll tell you, not a lot of workers get that. But then take a look at, at some of these issues on the job site. I have a supportive supervisor. Doesn't really stack up sometimes. Sorry, missed that one. Let's just go back real quick. I have a good friend at work. Now this is where the trades do better. So you have somebody to lean on. You have support on the job site. That is better than the Canadian average. However, there is an issue here when it comes to getting direction. Contradictory management on the job, causing frustration. Hearing one thing from one person and then getting instruction that's opposite in the other. However, again, building trades, unions, members, have the tools and authority to get the job done. They have autonomy. They're able to fulfill their purpose and their work. And this builds, obviously, um, a, a strong and confident workforce. Brother Royer talked about that report we had from the United States talking about the financial security or insecurity of workers. Once again, yes, that leads to mental health conditions, stress. But look at this statistic here. Only 10% of the people who we talked to said that they were falling behind and couldn't see a way out. 40% said, yes, we're, you know, I'm able to get through. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I can cover day-to-day you know, -day expenses. But if you look down there, 36% said they're keeping ahead of their expenses, their bills. And even more so, 13% said that they're doing okay and they're able to put some money away. That speaks volumes to the leadership here in the room to be able to get a good deal for your members. So now let's drill down into what we learned specifically about the trades and some of the other bigger issues that we wanted to collect some data on. Now I said the building trades have some unique factors. Let's all agree, a job site, a place of work for a building trades worker is very different than for the average worker here in the country. So this is the question. How does your work environment impact your mental health? You have 75% of the people who responded saying, the work environment does play a role on my mental health. What are the issues? How are these people feeling? Of the people who said they had poor mental health, either often, regularly, occasionally, stress, on the job stress, they have anxiety, burnout, depression, insomnia. Only 13% said none of the above. 7% said other. Here's something interesting. We wanted to find out who was seeking help or has sought help. 32% said, yes, I have had to seek help for mental health. 68% said, no, I haven't yet. I haven't. That does not exclude the fact that they, they may need that help. Here's the data on use of alcohol or drugs to cope with their mental health concerns. Again, about 50%, just under 50% say that they use drugs or alcohol to deal with their mental health. Now this is not, this is not exclusive to the trades. This happens everywhere, but this is the data that we're showing. I'm sure each and every one of us in the room has had to cope at some point or another with our own mental health. However, this is unique. Getting an injury on the job that requires pain management, specifically taking drugs in order to deal with pain, 34% have said yes. I have had to take drugs to deal with pain resulting from an injury on the job in order to be able to go to work to be able to get better. Use of alcohol or drugs for pain. 
less so than mental health, but still prevalent. The question is, do you use alcohol or drugs for pain while on the job site? And those are the stats. However, when we look at this question, which is similar but different, have you used or witnessed somebody else using substances to manage pain or mental health while on the job site? 53% said, yes, I have either used or witnessed someone using drugs or alcohol or substances to deal with pain or mental health on the job site. When asked if they've ever had a problem with addiction, 29, almost 30% said yes. Now, I think it's also important for us to recognize that original stat that I told you that um, 75% of the respondents have been working in the trades for at least 10 years or more. So over their lifetime, I guess that number can increase. But that also speaks to the kinds of issues that, that your members are facing. But this is where we get into some of the really important conversation for us here today. As, as union leaders, as people representing your, your workers. Do your members feel comfortable approaching the union about their mental health for treatment? Almost 60% said yes. I think that's a tremendous victory and that speaks to the kinds of relationships that you do have with your members. What about for alcohol and substance use? Yes, again, we see 60% said yes, I feel comfortable approaching my union. Do your members believe that your support services improve their overall health? Once again, you have 87% saying yes. My union makes my overall health better. Are managers equipped to deal with mental health issues related on a job? Unfortunately, you have a large section, you have almost 50, you have a little over 50% who say no. Managers aren't equipped on the job site to deal with mental health issues. Now what about support services? What's the awareness like for your members regarding the help that they can get for mental health? Again, only 32% said they were unaware 13% weren't sure, but you have about 50% of your members who said, yes, if I have a mental health problem, I think that there is a program for me. About 10%, yes, they're definitely sure. So this question was, would you use mental health services tailored specifically for building trades workers? or if, sorry, if they had used mental health support services tailored specifically for building trades workers, only 8% said yes, which is sad. The vast majority said no. So they are seeking help outside of their union family. Have they received training from their union or from their employer on mental health related issues stemming from problems at work. 38% said yes, they got an inadequate amount, they know something about it, but 62% said no, not enough. Once again, this goes into the priorities. Workers suffer injuries on the job, they work in pain, they end up being prescribed medication. It is a gateway to other issues. They would like the unions and employers and contractors and developers to understand that this is a real life challenge that they're faced with. Of note here, drug tests, drug testing, overwhelmingly the vast majority said no. These unfair drug screens aren't working for them and it's not making things better. 
So once again, you can see that this is how it breaks down in terms of the, the raw data. Again, they, your members want support. They're looking for help. It's our job to make things easier for them. But what are the barriers for, for your members to seek help? First, lack of awareness. So 24%, they don't know where to go for services. Members don't have time. They're on the job. They got to get home to their family. They don't have time. Their fear of repercussions, if they were to tell somebody that they're suffering from mental health issues or they have substance use problems, their fear of repercussions from either the union, their employers, or even their friends. They have financial constraints. There's a stigma attached to seeking help for these kinds of problems. It's a hard barrier to break down. The report that Bert Royer had showed earlier goes into depth about the stigma attached to mental health and workers. So these are the key takeaways. So what I've shared with you is not the complete full data set. I'd be up here for another hour if we just simply don't have time for that. But those are, the, those are the top line results to get everyone excited about the work that we're doing. First off, mental health is the number one health concern that your members identified. The second one is that your members say that they have unique stresses from the job and the work environment. Pain and pain management is a contributing factor. And that substance use for pain and mental health is happening. It's common. Members want more education. Your members want more engagement. So here's the thing. We're going to continue doing this research. Now, I know earlier you were asked to turn off your phone. I'm going to ask all of you to just pick up your phone right now. Go on and do it. You, got, you all have your phones. I see them because every half of you are on them. <laughs> OK, just pick them up. Take a look at that QR code. And this is what I want. This is what I would love. And I know that Sean and the executive, all of the affiliated unions, want you to go ahead, take this survey home, bring it to your members. The more data that we can collect, remember, everything is confidential, completely confidential. Everybody who answers this survey is 100% anonymous. But the data that we're able to collect from different skilled trades people who work and live in different places of the country, who have a unique set of circumstances, help compile a story that will then help your union provide the services your members need. The survey that we've produced here, the information that we're gathering, is not so that way we can produce a report. It's so that way the unions can help their members, that we can understand the challenges that they're facing, that they are unique, that these workers are special, and they need help. And we want to know how to do that. And I'm very grateful, I'm extremely grateful, to Sean, to the executive of Canada's Building Trades Unions, thank you to the leadership of the affiliated unions, Thank you very much to the CBTU staff. Uh, Lindsay and her team have been just terrific. And I'd like to thank everybody in the room here who, um, who've given me this time today to present these findings. I encourage you, please, get involved, bring this survey back home, and uh, we will produce a very substantial report that you will be able to distribute to your union and to your members that gives a real picture of the issues Canadian workers are facing in the construction trades. So thank you all very, very much. Thanks, John. Good job.